We're going to spend one more time this morning just in, the, in Ephesians 5, verse 18, the first part of the, of the verse. And I just want to remind you and, and do a little catch-up reminder to start with. When he says there, Ephesians 5, 18, be not, and be not drunk with wine when there's excess, I, I've tried to say to you that's not about the issue of booze. Uh, that's not just a verse to tell you don't, don't go out and drink booze, don't get drunk, that kind of stuff. There's something more fundamental about that. It's, it's, it's said in connection with verse 17, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine when there's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The idea there is that there's, there's a spiritual, uh, intoxicating, seductive policy of the adversary to try to pull you away from the truth of God's Word. If you look over at chapter 6, verse 12, when he concludes this section about the, the social structure of the believer that comes about because you walk in the Spirit, because you follow the Spirit's leadership and uh, in, in your life, the order that that brings, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, verse 10, he says, And finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a spiritual battle. Hold your hand there and come with me to Revelation 17. There's a spiritual battle that you and I are engaged in as believers today. We're literally on foreign territory, and there's a spiritual battle, and we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You go to the, the, uh, uh, the booth this coming weekend, and, and you get there and, and try to share the gospel with the world. The fight's not with flesh and blood. There's no reason to be in arguments with flesh and blood. There's a spiritual battle, though, that, that's deeper than flesh and blood, and you have to remember what the real issue is. The real issue is, is, is about the truth program and the lie program. The real issue is on a spiritual battle. And we, we, we wrestle against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, you remember we've talked a lot about in the last few weeks about the darkness of this world. Uh, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You remember that verse in Romans chapter 1? And he says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. That's where the darkness comes from. The darkness of this world is to say that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them up to a reprobate mind. That thinking process, that the entrance of thy word gives light, when you take the word of God out, you have darkness. And the thinking process that says, no, God, I don't want to think about God, I don't want God in, in, involved in it, I'll do it all myself, I'll do it all my way, they become vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart is darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. They say it's one way when it's another. You remember the verse in Isaiah chapter 5, what are them that call good evil and evil good? <laughs> and that's exactly what they're doing. You look around you today in our world and you see people calling good evil and evil good. And you scratch, you say, how in the world can it be? You should never say that. The way that is is the powers of darkness have taken effect. It should, a believer, someone educated in God's Word, should never wonder what's going on when they see that. Now, you can lament it, but the big thing is lamenting it doesn't help it. The, the thing that you need to do is turn on the light. <laughs> That's what you do with darkness. Click the light on. Cursing the darkness doesn't help. But he, said, he talks about the rulers of the darkness of this world. And I've been trying to talk with you for the last few weeks about those rulers. Revelation chapter 17 there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, come unto me, saying unto me rather, come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now you're going to see a picture here of the religious system that the Antichrist rises, rides into power. With whom? With the whore. The kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And that's the real thought back then in Ephesians, is don't be drunk with the wine of the fornication of the religious system. Don't be caught up in, 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 in the deception and into a drunken stupor brought about by being desensitized to the things of God by, by the overwhelming influence of this, of this woman. Who is she? Verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, mystery, comma, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This woman is, the, is, a, is a picture 
of the vain religious system that starts back in the book of Genesis and comes all the way through human history to the time of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is literally the personification of the lie program. And the lie program is carried on by this religious system. Verse 18, he says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, that's Babylon, watch, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. She is, the, she is a personification, an embodiment of the rulers of the darkness of this world. She identifies for you what it is to have, ha, have uh, the reign over the kings of the earth, reigning over. It's what Paul's warning about back in Ephesians. There is a system, an organized religious system, a spiritual force that seeks to intoxicate, to carry away, to desensitize you to the truth of God by this vain religious system that's operating there. And he, when he describes it, he describes it as principalities, powers, mights, dominions, the rulers of the darkness of this world. There's a, there's a system about, the, there's a, the, the whole thing that I've been trying to say to you now for three weeks, and my wife said, it's enough. <laughs> Your eyes said it was enough. I thought last week... I, I, I'm thinking last time I thought, you know, it's going over the head of some of you. And uh, for, for others of you saying, you know, okay, Brother Rick, I want you to see this stuff. I've been doing this little short series on this because this is important information for you to grasp and, 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 and to get a hold of. And frankly, I know it's, this is more Sunday night and Wednesday night kind of Bible studies. In, in fact, it, it, two weeks we'll go to Ridge Farm I'm going to teach some of this stuff in a little different forum uh, about the spiritual powers and so forth. But listen, every one of you can handle this information. This is information that every believer needs to have an awareness of because there is an organized system uh, set out by the adversary. When Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling against an organized system to produce darkness, spiritual darkness, not just in the world we live in, but in your life, in your family, in your associations. Colossians chapter 1 is a verse that you need to always keep in mind when you think about these things. Because when he talks about the rulers, here they are. Colossians 1 verse 16. For by him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that on earth, visible and invisible. I don't know if you've ever wondered about the Genesis 1-1, but when it says, in the beginning God created he the heaven and the earth. And we talk about that being the, the two realms, the two programs, prophecy and mystery, the two agencies, Israel and the body of Christ. But have you ever wondered why did he do it that way? You have the invisible and the visible. You've never wondered about that. Well, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to, tonight in our evening study, I'm going to try to explain to you why I think he did it that way. Because it's not just what God does, it's why does he do what he does? What's behind it? What's the wisdom? What's the understanding? What's, the not, what, what's he trying to convey with that? And there's something about himself that he's, put in, put, he's putting on display in those things. But you notice there's two realms. There's the heaven and the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, there's an organized structure of government in the heavens and in the earth. All things are created by him and, underline it, for him. Everything in the creation, in the heaven and the earth. And, and I emphasize that to you because it's not just, when you think about God creating, it isn't just that he created animals and trees and, and, and bugs and and pe he created a, a governmental system, a structure in which his creation is to operate and be governed by, and it was for him. He created it so that he could have a creation that would in intelligently participate with him in his creation. He didn't create a bunch of autotrons. He didn't create a bunch of robots. He created... People who are man, for example, in his own image. We're his image bearers. In his likeness, we have the freedom to function in, in fellowship with him. That's a wonderful kind of a thing. Now, when you think about those things, four things you always remember. Number one, they're real. 
It's not a figment of your imagination. Number two, they're organized. There's a structure to them. And I've talked to you the last couple of weeks about how that structure works. And he's populated all these positions of government and heaven and earth with, with, with intelligent creatures designed to participate with him in a genuine relationship of, 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 of participation and a genuine relationship. We literally can function as sons with the Father in these, in these things. But the third thing to remember is there's been a rebellion. These positions have, there's a war going on for, for the occupation of these positions. And the fourth thing is that God's got a reconciliation plan. And that's what the rest of the chapter talks about. Come back with me to Ezekiel chapter 28 just real quick. Ezekiel 28. There, there are half a dozen passages in your Old Testament that give you an insight into what, in, into what happened with, uh, with God's creation and the rebellion that's been, that, that's been fomented there. This is one of them, Ezekiel 28, verse number 11, talking about the, the, the king of Tyrus. And you'll, as you read this, you'll see it's talking about more than just the dude who's in Tyre. It's talking about the God of this world, the prince of, the, uh, of, of this world that he really represents. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the psalm, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been and eaten the garden of God. Now, think about that for a minute. You know that the king of Tyrus wasn't in Eden. Okay? Now, if we were to study Eden you'd find that there, there's a whole doctrine about Eden that goes from Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation. And it actually starts before Adam in your Bible. And that's where this character is. And God intends the earth to be, to be like the Garden of Eden. In fact, what he gave man's responsibility was to take that, that, that Eden and spread it over the whole planet and replenish the whole planet with it. So this character was there in, in, in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He was a walking jukebox. <laughs> he, 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 was, he was a walking musical instrument. And uh, he, he was actually, uh, I've said it many times, they, they, they used to say the devil fell out of heaven and landed in the choir loft. That's why in your life as a believer, music, and you know how influential music is in your life. You don't go a day without it in your life. And you know how powerful it is in your life. But it's also a, a, a tool that you have to be extremely careful about. And that's why. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walkest up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. So this is not God, this is a creature. Till iniquity was found in thee. Notice he's perfect. God created him. He's functioning uh, completely perfectly up to the standard God created him for until something happened. And what happened was that iniquity was found in him. Now, that word iniquity in your Bible is a very special term. It's a specialized kind of a term. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, we usually think of iniquity and sin. By the way, if you've been the last Wednesday night or two, uh, Pastor Kurz was teaching us a, a, a series about some of these things, and he was defining iniquity for you. And if you, don't, if you need a study on that, I'd recommend you go get those studies and listen to them for those of you who weren't here. Okay, and a few of you weren't here. <laughs> so, but that's why, I mean, I watched it Wednesday night in Pennsylvania, so I, I know what he said. But iniquity, the, 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 the short form of that is that iniquity the, the, is a word that has a special emphasis and reference to the satanic plan of rebellion. If you want to look at it, you go back at verse number 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart was lifted up, Lifted up by pride, Timothy says, and thou hast said, here's his original statement, I am God, a God, 
I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the sea, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. I'm going to sit in the seat of God. I'm going to go sit in the throne room of Jehovah, and I'm going to run the universe instead of Jehovah. Now you remember Isaiah chapter, hold your hand in Ezekiel, Isaiah 14, when he delineates his, his plan. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Here's the proverb that Israel mocks, the, uh, uh, mocks him with as he's cast down into, in, in, into the pit. Isaiah 14, verse 12. And by the way, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are, are looking to the future from where we are with relationship to the Antichrist and his career, and they're reaching back into the past saying, here's what you said originally, look what's happened to you now. Okay? These are not describing the past. The, 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 the prophecy is about what's going to happen in the future, but what's going to happen in the future is that wise plan you had to start with falls apart. 14.12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He starts out good. He started out perfect in beauty, the sum of wisdom. He started out as the son of the morning. God desires his creation to be run by sons, people who can participate genuinely in the operating and the decision-making process of his creation. Take his will and put it into effect. Lucifer, light bearer. He was the one whose strong right arm was to hold up the truth of God. But he's fallen. He's been cut down to the ground, which just weakened the nations. For thou hast said, this is like Ezekiel 28, when he says uh, that um, thou hast said in thine heart. Here's what he said. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he's got a position of governmental authority. But he doesn't want it just to be one of a bunch. He wants this to be above all the others. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's what he's saying over here. I will sit in the seat of God. Now we studied that issue about the mount of the congregation. The heavenly host gather themselves together and they come before God in, the, in, in, in a, in a uh, general assembly, a, a meeting together, a council meeting, and they make decisions. And they are reviewed for their activity and so forth. We, we looked at passages about all that. So there's this participatory activity of the heavenly hosts that gather together and Jehovah sits on the throne. The Lord Jesus Christ sits on the throne and is the one that they all give account to. He expresses his will and they, they determine how it should be carried out. This guy, he said, I'm going to take that position. He shouldn't be there. I should be. I'll ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to be the one who runs things. And that was his, his, his coup. He's going to have this coup in the heavenly host, and he's going to usurp the position as the head of the heavenly host, and he's going to hold the court, and he's going to sit in the seat of the government to oversee the administrative affairs of the cosmos. And everybody's going to come and answer to him and submit to him and worship him instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything was created for Christ, for him, to execute his will, carry out his will. You remember Revelation chapter 4? Now hold on to Ezekiel 28. Revelation chapter 4. All of this is review, and I'm looking at a couple of verses we didn't have time to look at before, but Revelation chapter 4, you go into the throne room that they're talking about. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I saw in the spirit, was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. That's the seat this dude wants to take over. And he that sat was, uh, was to look upon like, like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like a, 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 unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. So here you have the throne of God, and then you have elders, 24 elders sitting out there. And if we were going to study the structure of this, there'd be 24 elders, and there'd be another 70 that go out beyond that. And then all this is dividing up, the, and you have this whole lineage and division 
uh, of, uh, of government and structure and rank and authority. And this guy says, I'm not going to be out here among the crowd. I'm going to be the standout and sit up here on the throne. I, I want the big seat. But here's what's going on on the big seat. Verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there, there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, and were seven spirits, uh, which are the seven spirits of God. So there's all this entourage in the heavenly host, this organization to carry out different functions. Verse number 9, And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. All what things? Colossians 1.16. All the, prince, the thrones, dominions, principalities. He created not just the physical universe, but he created all these dudes to run the thing and the positions that they operate in. For thy pleasure they are and were created. For his pleasure. They're there to dispense his will. All those creatures are there. And the four and twenty elders, they say, you created it and they're for you. They're not for us. We're just occupying it to do your will. You don't want us in the job here. The, the, the crown's yours. The authority's yours. Well, this character back here in Ezekiel said, I want that seat. And the iniquity that was found in him, the crookedness that was found in him, was to say, I'm going to be God. I'm going to sit on the seat that really the Lord Jesus Christ should, is occupying, and I'm going to be like the most. I'm going to be the possessor of it all. Now, watch what he does with Ezekiel 28. Verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, and underline that word merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Now you notice the sin that he committed is called iniquity. That's why I said it's sin, but it's, it, it's a special aspect about sin. You go back to the Psalms, 51 and so forth, and you'll see that uh, there are three words your Old Testament uses, sin, <coughs> iniquity, and transgressions. Each one of them talk about a different aspect of what it is. It's all part of the rebellion. Therefore I will cast thee as profane, there's another issue, out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. I'm going to throw you out. You're not going to be there anymore. That's where he wanted to go to. Thine heart was lifted up. There's the problem. With, <coughs> with, <coughs> was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. So he's got beauty, he's got wisdom, but he's corrupted it. Verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries with the multitude of thine iniquities, and by the iniquity of, of, of thy trafficking. I want you to say the word traffic. That word iniquity, uh, merchandise. And verse, what the, you know what it is when you merchandise something? You put it up for sale. You know what it is to, be, to traffic something? You're, you're selling it. You're trying to move the merchandise. Okay, in, in, a, in, a business with, uh, in a business that sells stuff, they have a traffic department, a traffic officer moving stuff into the market. The, he literally went out and sought to sell his plan, sell his ideas to others in the heavenly host. So he says in verse 16, they've filled the midst of thee with violence. He says that thou, uh, you've, been, he's been, you've been cast down, going to be destroyed going to bring forth fire. God stopped the rebellion with a judgment on that rebellion. You remember Matthew 25 verse 41? Jesus has those nations gathered before him and he says, depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. God literally stopped the spread of the lie program with a judgment that was so horrendous, so startling, that it literally stopped in his tracks the rebellion. Now go back with me to Colossians. So 
the system that God set up to carry out the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ has been usurped. God has, God the Father has devised a plan of reconciliation. He isn't going to be thwarted by the rebellion. It's not like he didn't know the rebellion was coming. Someone asked me in a Bible conference just recently, why in the world, if God knew Satan was going to rebel, did he create Satan? Now, that's always the question people say. Well, if, 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 if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have done it. Like you're smarter than God. Well, you aren't, so well, let's mark that one up as a, as a dumb question. The thing is, there's something else going on here than just being smart. Colossians chapter 1, verse eight, 17. For he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why is he the head of the body of Christ? That in all things, all the principalities, powers, dominions, and, and, and thrones, he might have preeminence. That's the Father's will, that Jesus Christ would have the preeminence in all of the universe, that everything in the universe, heaven and earth, visible and invisible, the angelic world, the human world, would, would live in harmonious purpose of exalting and honoring and glorifying His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father believes that if you could see in His Son what He sees in Him, you wouldn't do anything but what He does, you'd love Him. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. All what things? I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Where did you just read that? That's verse 16. That's not talking about getting the devil saved out of the lake of fire. That's not talking about everybody's going to be saved in the end by and by kind of thing, universal reconciliation issues. That's talking about the things in the context. And in case you, don't, you, you missed it, he says, I'll tell you what things, the things in heaven and the things in earth that I just told you about back in verse 16. He's got a plan to reconcile the system back under his authority. Now, how's he going to do it? He's going to do it through the nation, through man. The seed of the woman becomes the seed of Abraham, becomes the Lord Jesus Christ, becomes the nation Israel, and he's going to, he vests a kingdom in the nation Israel to do what? Establish the authority of Jesus Christ in the government of the earth. That's called prophecy. Then he had a, another plan that he didn't tell anyone about called the mystery, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, to form another agency, the body of Christ, to do what? Give him the preeminence in the government in the heavenly places. That's why you've been, you've been given a, you, you live in a body that's of the earth earthy, but you're going to be given a body that's a spiritual body. That's why Colossians chap, uh, Philippians chapter 3 is talking about your glorified body. He's going to give you a body. It's going to be changed, fashioned like in his body, according to the power whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. All what things? All those things right there in verse 16. All those things in verse 20. You're going to get a glorified, resurrected body, which, by the way, we'll talk about next week. I'm just giving you teasers here. That is going to give you the capacity to function in that realm, in the heavenly places, to bring in subjection the government of the heaven, to reconcile all of that back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, you've been made a part of something this big. God has this cosmic plan for his son. He's not thwarted by Satan's rebellion. Come with me, look at 1 Peter chapter, hold on to Colossians, Ephesians and look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. He's talking about being redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained, see that, before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was foreordained by the Father before he created anything to shed his blood. You follow that? Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. When people ask you, when you ask yourself, what... Why did God let 
you know, create man if he knew he was going to sin? Why did he create Satan if he knew he was going to sin? He already had the plan of reconciliation on the table before he created them. You see, he didn't, it didn't come as a surprise to God when he gave freedom to his creatures. He understood the risk that freedom involved. The risk of a creature having freedom, freedom means you've got two choices. The risk is they make the wrong choice. And God knew that the only person he could trust not to make the wrong choice was himself. Okay? So he knew if, it, if I give freedom creatures that are going to function like I function, like the Godhead functions, with freedom and liberty, to function as sons, willingly choose to, uh, to execute the will of the Father, I've got, a, I've got the possibility that they'll rebel. So I'm going to make provision so if they do rebel, I can fix it. And what's the provision going to be? Revelation chapter 13, verse uh, 8. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of, of, of life of the Lamb. What? Slain from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world, God in the mind of God, Jesus Christ had already agreed to go. He's determ the determinant counsel for knowledge of God was he was going to go to the cross. If so it didn't, th the, the, the rebellion didn't thwart the plan of God. He had a pre-planned answer. He knew he would ultimately have to trust himself. So the plan was that God would become man and do for man what man couldn't do for himself. And he had pre-planned it. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I know, you're thinking, why, don't you look, why aren't you looking at Paul? Well, Paul says the same thing. This is the plan for prophecy. This is the plan for the mystery. Because the only plan is that the blood of Jesus Christ is what accomplishes the whole thing. And the blood of Christ wasn't an afterthought. It was a pre-planned event. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and not blamed before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children. Notice that God had a plan before the foundation of the world where he's chosen us in Christ. The issue of Christ and, and the body of Christ and how you get into Christ by trusting his blood, he, he, him as the one who died and rose again for you, all of that was pre-planned. So God understood what was happening and he accepted, the Godhead accepted the risk of freedom. And that's why I've been going over with you this issue, this, the pattern that God operates in. And I haven't been so much interested. I, you got to understand the structure and stuff. But what I'm really interested in, you understand, is how God's creatures, angelic or human, are designed to operate. God gives his will. And then he gives a genuine participation on the part of his sons. That's why we need to not be babies. We need to be sons. We need to grow up to maturity. We're not a bunch of cosmic autotrons. We're not a bunch of robots. God is designed to, to, to take willing, free, fully free creatures and to give meaningful, genuine participation in carrying out His will. To develop it to fullness, to the fullness of our creative genius and capacity. To me, that's, that's, that, that is the most exciting thing about, about the Christian life. God tells me his will. And then he says, here, you take my will and you put it into practice in your life. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? He doesn't micromanage that. He macromanages it. He says, here's my will. You say, how am I, what am I supposed to do? He says, get on with it. Well, how am I supposed to do it? Figure it out. You say, well, what about this? He said, look in the book and find out what I told you about it. 
You say, well, there's not something specifically about that. He says, are you sure? Have you looked everywhere? No. You know what you find? You find all the instructions you need to do everything God gives. What do you say? The scripture is given that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Everything you need to know to do everything God has for you to do is in that book. But he doesn't say you need to do it the way I do it, and I don't need to do it the way you do it. He says you need to do it the way you would do it. Let's demonstrate how Christ living in you would do it. And there's that issue of freedom. Now, come back with me to Daniel chapter 2. That runs counter to what the religious system calls the sovereignty of God. Now, that term, the sovereignty of God, that's a very interesting term. The term sovereign is a governmental term. Uh, we, we, we live in a sovereign state. It, right now, you, you, you read about money, and you read about uh, the euro and the British pound and the, the chafee and the dollar and, and the, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, years, two, two years or so, they were talking about the, uh, Greece and all the financial. And they talk about sovereign currency. Sovereign currency is the currency authorized by a government. And when you talk about the sovereignty of God, it's really double talk. God equals sovereign. So you're talking about, you know, the, the God of God, or the sovereign of the sovereign. It's, two, it's it really two words. The term God in the Bible, and, uh, you, you know, you, you hear, everybody's heard the, the, the Hebrew term Elohim. And Elohim is a, is a, is a word that's translated God and gods, plural. It's a plural word, but it depends on the context with its singular plural. The word God, the word Elohim, is not a, a word talking about the essence of the person in the position. It's talking about the position a person's in. And when you're, a, when you're an Elohim, you're the top guy in the... You, you, there, nobody above you. You're the top guy in that position. Okay? That's why you can have gods with a little g, and you have God with a big g. The God with the big G, Jehovah, there ain't nobody above him. Everybody else is below him. Jehovah is a Elohim, but no, Elohim, no other Elohim is Jehovah, <laughs> so to speak. But you have all the gods with the little g. And God gives them jobs and sovereign positions of, of activity under him. So there's a structure. So the term is to talk about a positional term, not, not the essence. Of who, the essence of who God is is Jehovah, I am. In government, sovereignty is just, a, that's who God is. He's the top guy. Well, the idea of sovereignty in religion is that he makes a decision, everything has to be that, and everything in life is controlled by him. Now, that is not the sovereignty of the Bible. That's the sovereignty of religion. Let me show you. Daniel chapter 2. Here's a fascinating issue. Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees an image. Daniel interprets the image. He says in verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. The God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the heaven, hath he given into thy hands, and hast made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the, is the king. He's the ruler over everything under his domain, domain. Verse 39, After thee shall arise another king, kingdom, underline that next word, inferior to thee. All right, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the head of gold. After him is going to come another king. It's going to be Media Persia. But that kingdom is going to be inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's. Now what's that talking about? Come on to chapter 4. And watch Nebuchadnezzar. Look at chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5, verse number 18. 518. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, talking to Belshazzar, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages, trembled and feared before him. Whomsoever he would, he slew. Whomsoever he would, he kept alive. 
whomsoever he set up and whomso uh, he would, he put down. Nebuchadnezzar could do anything he Johnny well pleased. Why? Top dog. That's what it means to be sovereign. That's what it means to be God. If I decide to do it, I can do it. Set you up, okay, you displease me, whack, whack you down. That's the sovereignty of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the next guy, chapter 6, Darius, Babylon Falls, chapter 5, verse 30, in the night was Belshazzar, the king of Chaldea, and slain, and Darius the midnight, Midian took the kingdom. So here's the next kingdom. Now you, re you remember the story of Daniel and the lion's den. That's what's in Daniel 6. Daniel goes and prays. Some guys don't like him, so they get the king to make a decree. Verse number 8. 6, 8. Now, king, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. Verse 15. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Knowest thou, O king, the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed? Now, why are they saying that? Because they tricked him into condemning Daniel. When Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den, he didn't want to throw him there, but I made the decree it has to happen. He couldn't change his mind. That's an inferior sovereignty to the one Nebuchadnezzar had. Nebuchadnezzar could have said, no, hey guys, I don't want to do it now. Forget it, I ain't doing it. Because he could, whatever he wanted to do, he could do. Darius couldn't do that. His hands were, were clasped, cuffed, because he had already made a decree, and the decree couldn't be changed. Now, that's the sovereignty of Calvinism. That's the sovereignty of religion. God made a decree, and everything has to be exactly according to the decree he made in eternity past. That's why they argue about lapsarianism, sublapsarianism, superlapsarianism, no lapsarianism. They get all this stuff that's got... All this mental gymnastics because they're trying to figure out something that ain't so. God's sovereignty is a sovereignty of absolute, total liberty and freedom. And God invites His creation into a free participation, a genuine, meaningful participation in carrying out His will. Jeremiah chapter 18. I look at the clock and I say, wow, I got 30 more verses. Get Jeremiah 18, one hand, Luke chapter 10. And Philemon chapter Philemon. Luke 10, Jeremiah 18, and Philemon. And I'll tell you those, and I won't promise you that's it, but I'll tell you that's what my intention is to be it. And there are a lot of other verses like this. We just look at these. Jeremiah 18. Here's what God tells Jeremiah. Verse, chapter 18, he takes him to the potter's house. He says, look at the potter. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 9, about the potter's house. Romans, Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. The potter's making a vessel. It gets marred in his hands. He mushes it down, remakes it. Okay? God says, here's, here's what it means. Verse 8, verse, uh, Jeremiah 18, verse 6. O house of Israel, can I not do unto you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in mine hands, O house of Israel. What did he do? Potter's making the vessel. He got marred in his hands. He squishes it down, and he makes it again. That's what verse 4 says. I can do that with you. At verse 7, at, that, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down and to destroy, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I have thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak unto the concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. You see, it's not a fixed decree that doesn't have any participation, free partic intelligent participation of the, uh, of the other side. He's not locked into something. God has the freedom to respond to the actions of men. And what determines is, the, is the, 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 if he's going to reshape the, 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 the issue is the response that people have. 
I just want you to understand, listen, there's not this prearranged life map that everybody has to follow because God eternally decreed it to be that way. God has expressed His will. We've looked at passage after passage after passage and seen how even in the heavenly host, God will express His will and then invite others to participate in the how will we do this because He's educating them in His will and in His thinking. Isn't that how you teach your kids? <laughs> Don't they tell you to teach your children the most effective way is matching and mirroring? You tell them, do this, do this, do this. But if you sit down with them and say, hey, we want to do this, and if we do this, and you have a hands-on kind of thing, they'll learn a lot better. You know that. The greatest way to teach anybody is, is, is to, to let them mirror what you're doing. Let them see you do it, and then let... I know when I taught my... I told my wife how to drive a standard ship car. Boy, that was an experience. Woo. <laughs> we had a little Volkswagen Bug. You remember those Bugs back in the 60s? Beetle, not, not a Beetle. Well, it was before the Beetle, it was the Bug. And it was standard ship. She never drove a standard ship car before. So I, we, we get out in it, and I said, look, push the clutch in. There's first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. Do it again. Blah, blah, blah. And, and she says, okay. I said, okay, let's go. She said, do what? I said, do whatever you think you ought to. <laughs> you know what I do now shift gears how to do that you know how to do it push clutch in and you know what I sat there with her and you know by the time we went down the end of the road and came back I had a headache but she'd learned to do it <laughs> it was that hands on with you there to help her you, you know that that participatory genuine learning process well, that's what God does with his creatures. Luke chapter number 10, verse 30, Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, and, and, and which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and de departed, leaving him half dead. And by the determinate counsel and full knowledge of God, there came down a certain priest that way. It, no, she didn't say that. Now listen, Jesus Christ is God himself. He knows exactly how he plans his creation to operate. He's telling the story. He could tell it any way he wants to tell it. And he didn't say anything about some determined counsel and foreknowledge before the foundation of the world. He said that priest got up that morning and by chance went this way. Now what does that mean? Brother Meldera used to say, luck is the residue of design. I love that as a... He said, you believe in luck, I believe in the residue of design. By chance. The guy got up that morning and said, you know what I need to do today on my, my honey-do list is I need to go to Jerusalem. And he made the choice to go to Jerusalem and he wound up passing by the guy. You understand, listen folks, you have responsibilities to make choices and the choices you make bring things into your life. And God himself is not determined it has to happen this way and there's no other way it can happen because I set the decree. That's an inferior. If that's your concept of God, you have a low view, you have an inferior view of sovereignty, of God's godliness. God's godliness is Nebuchadnezzar. I can do it. If I change my mind, I cannot do it. That's what Jeremiah 18 says. And Jeremiah 18 tells you the basis upon which he doesn't change his mind capriciously. He changes his mind about the application of his will based upon the applicant. But where he's putting it. The will doesn't change. But when man changes, then things change. Come with me to Philemon. Paul does this. You know the story of Philemon Onesimus? Onesimus was Philemon's slave. He ran away from Philemon, and he stole Philemon's stuff, goes to Rome, he's in jail with Paul, he gets saved, Paul sends him back. And he tells Philemon, he says, receive him, not as a slave, but as a brother. He's profitable to me for the ministry. And he says to them, verse 8, he says, Wherefore, though I, I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient, Yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech you. He said, I, Paul, Philemon, you owe me, and I could tell you to do this. But I'm not going to tell you to do something without thy will. I wouldn't, wouldn't do it. 
but I'm going to ask you to do it because you love me. That's what beseeching is. Verse 14, but without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of, of necessity, but willingly. That's why God requires and invites willing participation, genuine, meaningful participation on your part. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. He didn't say, God planned this before the foundation of the world, he would depart so you'd have this opportunity to show your love. He said, perhaps. He said, Philemon, here's my will. Now you can choose to make it so if you will. You follow that? That's the issue. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. That's what I've been trying to say to you. We've been allowed of God. He's given us the high calling and privilege of genuine, meaningful participation on our part to participate with Him as sons. You have a choice. You have a freedom to participate. And you are competent to do so. He's given you the competence in His Word. And you have a motivation. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead, that they which live might henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto Him that loved them and gave Himself for us. When you understand that you've been bought with a price. The love of Christ motivates you. And it constrains you. It literally puts an internal compulsion in you that carries you along. And chapter 2, verse 13 talks about the word that works effectually in you that believe. And when your faith willingly chooses to believe God's word, that word becomes that energy, that working, that internal compulsion and the energy and the power of that word works. That's why. And by the way, that's what you've been allowed to have. It's not forced upon you. It's a privilege given to you to willingly choose to walk by faith, by depending on who He is and who He's made you. It's a choice that you make by faith. And it's a choice God is by faith faith that it might be by grace. The only response grace will accept is faith in your walk day by day. And your faith resting on an intelligent understanding of God's word to you is what allows the Spirit of God to take the power of that word and strengthen you in your inner man and let that be what provides that inner compulsion to have that life live out through your body of flesh for His glory. That's why all this stuff back in Ephesians 5, verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. We're talking about your walk. Make some choices to walk. A choice of faith to walk in the wisdom of God's truth. Be not unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine. Don't be seduced by the performance-based systems of the vain religious system and the world and the flesh and the devil. But be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God take the love and grace of God that's yours in Christ Jesus and control your life. And that happens by faith. And like I said, I've gone over these things, and I, I know, you know, it's Sunday morning, but look, it's the, it's the summer crowd. Okay, next time we'll start, we'll get on in, into being filled with the Spirit, and we'll do some of that jazzy stuff. <laughs> but I've done that so that you can realize that this stuff is real, and it's serious. 
Folks, there are spiritual forces at work behind the scenes. There's more than simply human and fleshly ungodliness going on. You look at our world out here. Listen, Paul's very clear that the nations are enslaved to devils, to lesser gods, who can't provide salvation, and, and they're unjust, and they're unloving. And when you see how these guys operate and how the nation's out here under the control of them, you say, there's spiritual wickedness that rules the darkness of this world. And you and I have been given the light and the truth that liberates you and allows you to walk in that wisdom of God. Don't be deceived by the wine of the fornication of the vain religious system that wants you to trust yourself and not God's grace. But get yourself under the control of the grace of God, the Spirit of God through His Word. And that's why you have to rightly divide it. That's why you have to understand the grace of God that it's not who, who you are and what you do, it's who Christ has made you and what he's done and how that word works in you for his glory. Okay? All right. If you're here this morning, you've never, you've never trusted Christ alone as your Savior. Can I tell you, I see people all the time, right where I was many years ago, I'd sit in a meeting like this and on my way to hell, and nobody would have known it because I, I, was, I had all the religious pedigrees. But I knew in my heart that I wasn't right with God. I knew in my heart that if I died right then, I'd wind up in hell because I didn't have my sins forgiven. I didn't have eternal life. And one day I heard the good news that it wasn't what I did, it's what he did. I always, and never time in my life I didn't believe that Jesus wasn't God that died on the cross for my sins, the sins of the world. But I just never trusted him alone. I always thought you had to work to do something. You had to work to believe. Maybe you don't care about any of it. Maybe you say, it's worthless, it's hopeless, I'm too far gone. Well, you're never too far gone from the grace of God. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. The answer is in, in Christ. The answer is in trusting Him exclusively to be the Savior God put Him at Calvary to die for you to be, rose again for you to be author of eternal life. When you trust it in the quietness and stillness of your inner man, right inside, the total personal privacy that is required for you to have freedom, when your heart, God sees your heart resting in His Son, depending on Him exclusively, God will save you just like that. Then it'll all make some sense to you. It'll all be different. And you know the joy of having your sins forgiven. You know the, the, the comfort of having everlasting life, a home in heaven when you die, but that life being your life right now. If you've never done that, don't leave here today without getting that settled. If you have a question, the people all over this room will be happy to sit with you with an open Bible and show you the answer. For those of you that are saved, not most of you are, hey, let's get on with it. Take it personally. God intends you to. Okay? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your grace to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the matchless, marvelous privilege that you've given us to be a part of of an everlasting exaltation of your Son. No one could ever be more worthy. And we thank you for that privilege of Christ.